The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. Hi, this is Mia Mohsen Zia, also known as Mia No Time for Love. Check out my latest book, Missing, available in print and e-book formats on Amazon. It's now time for the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios and sponsored by international award-winning author Mia Mohsen Zia of Missing. The Mike Wagner Show can be heard on over 40 podcast platforms, as well as HamiltonRadio.net, Diamonds FM, and the TheMikeWagnerShow.com. We can be heard in over 100 countries, featuring over 1,000 well-known and amazing guests throughout the globe, and named one of the top 100 global podcasts in the New York Weekly Times, Hollywood Entertainment News, Los Angeles Weekly Times, Apple, and Chartable. So sit back and relax and enjoy another great episode of the award-winning Mike Wagner Show. Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention Mike Wagner Show, get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, time to give official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, international war ring author, Mia Molson Zia. If you love fast-paced mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon and Paperback Neva. Missing is fast-paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is an illusion and those you love will be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon and Paperback Neva. Missing by Mia Molson Zia has garnered great reviews and Eve Love and Enjoys by Howard's celebrities, including Joanna Cassie, Forge Riley, and many others. So grab your copy today for goes Missing by Mia Molson Zia available on Amazon. Also check out the Mike Wagner show at the Mike Wagner show.com on over 40 podcast platforms heard in over hundred countries, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also Anchor FM, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Audible, Apple Music, and also heard on HamiltonRadio.net, Diamonds FM, all these radio and a few networks coming soon. Take the Mike Wagner show with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Wagner show on the YouTube channel. Follow the Mike Wagner Show on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok today. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Wagner Show podcast. T-shirts, pop sockets, throw pillows, tote bags, hoodies, and baseball gear makes great gifts 24-7. Go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Wagner Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia for great books like Missing, Once, and Wrinkles. Also, T-shirts, pop sockets, hoodies, phone cases, and more. Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia. Check it out today. I'll support the Mike Wagner Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, the Mike Wagner Show.com. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com at the Mike Wagner Show. Make sure you do so today. We're here with a terrific lady who was born and raised in New York City, and uh, she's a psychiatrist for 30 years, conducting groundbreaking research in, on brain imaging on psychopaths. She spent nine years confronting German bureaucrats who buried her case at the bottom of the pile and told her her family would probably be dead by the time she won and ordered to split the proceeds with a Nazi business um, and discovered the building to be um, used as um, making Nazi flags. We'll talk about that. And uh, she has a new book out, which is a memoir called Summoned to Berlin and described challenges she faced, which uh, overcame during um, a long decade search for, um, for restitution and uh, at, a, at a particular place and uh, from her family, from the Nazis as well. So she tells an amazing story about that. Live, ladies and gentlemen, from the Plus Studios in beautiful downtown New York City, the, um, the amazing, multi-talented uh, psychiatrist of 30 years and author of Summoned to Berlin, a memoir, Ladies and gentlemen, we got the very multi-talented and author, Dr. Joanne Intratore. Dr. Joanne, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. I'm, I'm thrilled to be with you. I think it's a great honor to be with you. I've watched your show, and I'm very happy that I'm participating in it right now. Well, it's great to have you on board as well, too, Joanne. And, of course, uh, reading about your um, your, your amazing uh, memoir called Summoned to Berlin. You spent nine years confronting German bureaucrats who bury your case at the bottom of the pile and basically told your fam you'll probably be dead by the time the, uh, you, you won the case. And uh, we'll have you talk about that. You were born and raised in New York City, psychiatrist for 30 years, conducting groundbreaking research into brain imaging and psychopaths. And uh, before getting to all that, Dr. Joanne, tell us how I first got started. 
this all got started very sadly at the deathbed of my father in 1993. It was in Palm Beach, Florida. And um, I thought he'd already gone into a coma and he sits up and looks completely alert and much younger than I had seen him look in years. And he looks at me and says, are you tough enough yet? And do they know who you are? And then he lies back down and he passes away within a day. Wow. These were the last words my father uh, spoke to me. And basically he was setting before me the challenge of this restitution case that he had found out about a year before in Berlin. The reason he found out about it a year before was that the Berlin Wall had fallen and all this property in the historic center of Berlin, which was not in West Berlin, it was in East Berlin behind the Iron Curtain, now became available and a very large manufacturing bit building in what's called Berlin Mitte, the middle of Berlin, became available because my grandfather, his father's name, was found on what's called the Grundbuch, which is the history of the ownership of the building. And what it said was that he owned the building from, I don't know, maybe 19... 25, maybe even earlier than that, to 1938, when he lost the building in what was called a forced auction, it, which meant really he couldn't pay the mortgage to hold the building on. That was five years into the Nazi regime when he lost the building. Um, so I knew that I had quite a challenge ahead of me. I knew that I was going to do this for him. And I knew he was saying to me that he wanted me to be tough enough to do it because he knows that I approached a lot of things in my life with a lot of anxiety, but I ultimately get things done. I've... So uh, essentially a couple months later, I'm, I go to Berlin and I meet the lawyer that had presented the case to him before he had died. And I find out that there is a, uh, an obstacle which is that the descendant of the family of the, of the business that got the property in 1938 was challenging my family's right to restitution. And basically they were saying, I guess through their lawyer, that my grandfather lost the building in 1938, September of 38, because he was an incompetent businessman. This was an incredibly awful thing to hear. It was a real slur and it was absolutely absurd because it was five years into the regime. And that meant my grandfather had been broken with all his businesses, with all his money. And at that point he had no way of getting out of, out of, out of, out of Germany. So um, I, I almost didn't take it seriously. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. But I find out from my German lawyer that it has to be taken seriously. Um, and my German lawyer made a recommendation. He said, if you join up with these people, now I didn't know who these people were. I had no idea what they did. I didn't know where they were from, what kind of work they were in. I knew, basically the lawyer said, if you join up with them, you're going to make it through the bureaucracy of the, germ, of the German courts much quicker because there are thousands of cases of restitution cases facing us in Berlin and there's not very much staff. So he was, he was encouraging me, you know, just, you know, you, you joint venture with them. It's like splitting a cake, you know, you, you mm. want a piece of cake, but we'll split it. Mm. Interesting. I, if that's the case, I'll take some chocolate. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. But. And, just like you're laughing, I was like, this is ridiculous. This is no day, you know, this is this is a day at the beach for me. I knew that this was about anti-Semitism. The this these people were saying he lost it because not because he was a Jew, but because he was a lousy businessman. I knew that that wasn't true. However, as the lawyer said, East Berlin was overwhelmed with these cases. And um, to sort of uh, make his you know, to make his point even stronger, he said, you know, if you don't do it, you probably will win the case, but they'll go after you in, in an appeals court. And that's going to be awfully expensive. And by the time that's resolved, most of your family will be dead. Oh, that is like a slap in the face. When I read that, I'm like, oh my gosh. 
it, it really was a cruel thing to say, very, very cruel, but it, it didn't quite hit me the way it hit me over a period of time. I didn't really get a sense of the flavor of this case because here I was in Germany and Germany was very scary for me. Uh, my parents were refugees from the Nazis. Uh, the, the whole German language was overwhelming to me. It sounded very harsh. Um, I, I, you know, so I was somewhat afraid. So here was this very educated, very erudite lawyer. And this is what he said. However, that that did not mean that I was going to go along with him. I said, no, my family, and that consisted of my brother and my uncle, who was my father's older, older brother, who was in his 90s at the time. Um, we decided, of course, we're not going to joint venture this deal. We, 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 we're gonna go through with this. And uh, of course, I'm living in New York City I'm a mother of a small child, a wife, and I've got a major research project going at the Veterans Administration Hospital and Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And so I'm not going to be able to stay there and do all this. So this was a back and forth thing and very slow. He was very right. It was a very, very slow process. And because there was a fight brewing between myself and this other claimant, we were put, placed on the bottom of the pile. How the, so? It's like, what, what was their criteria on uh, placing where on the pile? Like, you know, top, middle, bottom. What was their criteria? The criteria was easiness. The top was, this is straightforward. We're getting, we can do it. This is a, a, a bunch of garbage. We're throwing it out. It went like that. And so I was told that the case was that complicated and they're not, they, they had five people working on it. At, you know, five, they were just, it, it wasn't, uh, they, they didn't have enough people working on these cases. And that to me was also very disturbing because all of East Berlin, when the wall came down, was one of the largest real estate packages in the entire world. So there were thousands of restitution cases, not just Jews, but other people as well that had lost property as a result of World War II. So uh, I, I, I didn't give it my full attention. I had my, my life to do, but I went back again. And uh, on my second trip, which was, I don't know, this probably in 95, I'm at a meeting, I'm exhausted. I'm always overwhelmed by jet lag for every trip that I go. The, uh, the, again, he's trying to convince me to joint venture. And I said, no, no, sir, I'm not going to do it. And then kind of just as the meeting was breaking up, he said, you know, there's a rumor that the Nazi flag was produced in the building. Mm, yes, I read about that. I was just going to uh, transition to it, but uh, keep going though. Yeah. And, uh, I said, the Nazi flag, well, that, that's it. They've, they've got to be Nazis. Who gets to do a building in 1938 unless you're connected to the Nazis? Oh, no. Frau Intrator is how he called me. We can't um, find those that information out. So I, again, uh, was sort of overwhelmed and whatever. I didn't know if you could find this information out. I assumed he was correct. This went on for quite a bit. Um, uh, there were two or three trips, and at one point, the the lawyer um, invited me to meet the judges involved in the case because we were now, you know, three or four years into this thing. As I said, I, I have a whole other life in New York, um, and he said we want you to meet the judges. Maybe if they meet you personally. So I I went to Berlitz because I knew quite a bit of German. And I, I tuned up at Berlitz. I took like all day courses for about, you know, two or three weeks so that I could be in the meeting because these people did not speak English. The West German lawyer spoke English, but the people in, in the East did not. So I went to the meeting and at the meeting, uh, one of the judges says to me, um, uh, your father, uh, he, he, he says he parrots the same thing. He was a, a, not a good businessman. And I, I, I looked at him and I said, how dare you speak about my, my father that way? Um, I'm good. I'm, and I went into my purse and I had a camera in my purse and I had it all loaded up. I didn't know why I brought my camera. I was kind of like in this altered state and I stood up 
and took pictures of the lawyers. And I said, I'm going to take these pictures and show my relatives in the United States what you look like. Wow. And everybody got went crazy. I'm crying. Tears are running down my eyes. And, um, and uh, everybody tried to settle me down. The chief the, the chief uh, judge brings me like a vitamin C candy as if, if, as if that's going oh to Oh my happen. gosh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And then um, she looks at me. She was the chief. There were three judges. She said, I'm going to put your case on the top of the file. Amazing. Like yeah. So I left that meeting. My lawyers were very proud of me that I had done this as if I had planned this. It was all intuitive. It was it was just like amazing that that this all happened. And so I thought we were on our way and we were not on our way. I find out now not only do my lawyers want me to negotiate this or these this judge wants me to negotiate. We she will rightly call the building our building, but we have to get rid of these opponents. We have to pay them off. And these really? yes, these opponents wanted between 30 and 50 percent whatever the value of the building was mm. now, mike i gotta tell you something interesting my percentage of this building was 3.15 percent which is very very little and what was happening the more i was being pushed you know into things that i didn't want to do which i didn't wind up doing the more I didn't care about that 3.15% because there was not much to care about. All I wanted to know was what happened in 1938. What was the circumstances? Who were these people? And I wound up hiring an investigator. Mm, okay. Now, now, just a couple of things that just popped in my head as well, too, that, um, you know, back in 1938, you know, when the, when the Nazis took over, uh, what was being manufactured in the building before, uh, before the takeover? clothing textiles uh hats um it was like in the garment district the way it was here in new york and the way it probably is in chicago you know um clothing mm -hmm. and women there were numbers of, of of people that uh uh had rented space in the building um and when i hire the detective i find out what happened to the different people that had space in the building before this uh, auction occurred and then after this auction occurred. And what he tells me is that the, the, the person that was opposing me was the, the, the descendant of a business that was sitting in the building since 1931. Wow. And they were sitting there, this, this company that was opposing our restitution was sitting there and waiting. They knew after 1933, you didn't have to pay a Jewish landlord. You, you, you had everything in your favor. You could sit, you could, you know, be in a building like that rent-free. This was an enormous building, like the length of a New York City block. That's how long it was with, with, uh, you know, uh, enormous numbers of, of different kinds of manufacturing going on in there. My de detective showed me a, sh a sheet of paper of all the Jews, Jewish owned businesses that left in at the, at the time of that forced auction and what was left. And what was left was this descendant who was challenging us and a flag company. And the flag company took over the entire building and made the Nazi flag. They had oh already gosh. Nazi flag and all the paraphernalia that goes along the bunting and all the things you see along a, a parade. But what I found out, which was absolutely heart shattering for me, was that they in in September of 1941, this company, the flag company, got the order to make one million Jewish stars that would be sewn on the Jews that were left in Germany to identify them to ultimately be sent east 
e being sent east is a euphemism for, for getting murdered. Mm, the, the Holocaust, yes. Exactly, exactly, Mike. And wow. that broke my heart that I, I heard this. I couldn't believe that this occurred in the building and that this is what I found out. And I suspect was known by the judge and might have been known by the lawyer. I don't know. I can't I can't pretend to know what was in anybody's mind. But um, what happened is, I mean, this is now I find this out nine years into this. I mean, there are lots of details to the story that are interesting and will be in my book. And I can't wait to send you the book and you'll see for yourself and maybe we'll get to talk again. But I I I it sort of broke my heart to mm. find out that these Jewish stars were made in the family building. Oh, uh, it, it is certainly sad. And of course, you know, just a few more we'll talk about in the book as well, too. I've got a couple of questions and we'll get into your profession, too, about, um, you know, working as a psych psychiatrist for 30 years, doing some research on um, brain image and psychopaths. We'll talk about just a minute. But first, listen to the Mike Widener Show at the MikeWidenerShow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at SonicWebStudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs at below the competition way. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at SonicWebStudios.com. Mention Mike White and your show will get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, time to give official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Widener Show, international war ring author Mia Molson Zia. If you love fast paced mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon paperback and ebook. Missing is fast paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is illusion and those you love will be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson Zia. Has garnered great reviews in Eve 11 and George by Howard celebrities, including Joanna Cassie, Forge Riley, and Manilis. So grab your copy today for Ghost Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show at the Mike Show.com on over 40 podcast platforms, heard in over 100 countries, also on HamiltonRadio.net, Diamonds FM, Oldies Radio, and a few networks coming soon. Take us with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. Follow the Mike Widener Show on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok today. For great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia for great books, merchandise, and more. I'll support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, the Mike Widener Show.com. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com at the Mike Widener Show. Make sure you do so today. We're here with the author of the book, uh, Summoned to Berlin, a memoir by, by Dr. Joanne in Trotour here on the Mike Wagner show. And um, of course you spent nine years conferring German bureaucrats about the case and you got to the top as well. And some thoughts that came to my mind as well too, when you talk about the building and um, when the building was first bought, first put up, it, it was basically his building. And, um, and of course, um, you know, what happened after the war, the war ended, um, what was it, was it, was it still being occupied making flags or what was it uh, being used, used afterwards? Well, the building was bombed and, uh, I've got, there's some dramatic pictures that showed what happened to it. It wasn't bombed to smithereens. It was it was rebuilt by the East Germans, and it, 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 it and it's really a stunning looking building. Um, it, it it served the purposes of the East German government and had different businesses that the East German government needed because it was very large and commodious. So. Um, uh, so when I got to see it, I mean, there was no evidence of it being bombed. You know, uh, when I went there the first time, it was it had been emptied out because the wall had come down and it was going to become a restitution case. OK. And, and, and also, too, with the building as well, too, that, um, you know, it was uh, separated between East Germany and West Germany and everything else. In terms of laws and regulations, um, it's, it seemed like the East Germany, you know, had, had like um, a different type of bureaucracy. Was it more was it more difficult? Was it just the same or was it like, in a sense, easier than West Germany? I mean, what degree of difficulty was it between with uh, East Germany compared to West Germany at the time? <laughs> I would imagine it had the building been in West Germany, if it had been in West Germany, it would have been dealt with after the war in the 1950s and 1960s, as other properties of my grandfather wound up uh, taking care of. But, and that's a whole other story, but um, it, it, the bureaucracy was such in East Germany that it came after the Nazi bureaucracy. In other words, there was no period of time of 
where any of these people had lived in a democracy. So the bureaucracy was essentially much worse. Mm. Okay. And, you know, and, and not dissimilar to kind of the authoritarian nature that one saw uh, as the Nazi regime was building itself. Okay. And then in terms of the building as well, too, that um, you're, you're talking like, you know, 30, 50 percent and everything. And uh, you're supposedly getting like 3.15. And I'm just getting these um, figures correct and everything else. Um, what is it? What is the current building of the what's the current value of the building uh, today? And uh, how much would you have gotten out of it based on the figures like, you know, supposedly you got 3.15, but you right. want like 30, 50 percent. What was the value of the I mean, building? Now and how I, much you got, I mean, Right now, you know, Berlin has really caught, come back. You know, I, I would imagine I would have gotten a million dollars or so if we did this now. When the building first became, uh, uh, my father first became aware of it, the building itself was considered to be, you know, maybe 15, 20 million dollars in American dollars and larger in German marks. Um, so my father would have gotten... Um, uh, six point five percent, and his brother his brother got six point five. There were other family members. My grandfather was in partnership with another part of our family, and they had a much larger percentage than than we did. I was into this because I'd been studying German history before I became a doctor. I was interested in why people become Nazis, how that happened. So I was I was set up to 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 go and um, to take this project on. So in the beginning, it looked like, all right, maybe I'll get something from my son Benjamin's college fund. And then who, who cared? I didn't care. All I wanted to know was what the story was. And so at the end of 2001, when this happened, actually, uh, we finally signed everything up in, in March of 2001, um, I got about $90,000 which basically may have paid for all well, my trips back and forth, hiring a law, you know, the, the, uh, the investigator. It, it, it meant nothing to me financially. It, all, it was all about honoring my father and, and, and honoring my family's reputation and finding the truth. The truth to me w was invaluable. Mm -hmm. You know, that my... Mm -hmm. And certainly invaluable indeed as well, too. And I thought about the $90,000 nowadays, it just uh, covers like gas expenses, the way gas is going these days. So. <laughs> uh, forget, it, forget about it. Oh, my God. Yeah. All over the world. We're in trouble. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. of course, and of course, you'll also be a doctor as well, too, you know, transforming that uh, you talk about in the life of Nazis and everything. You've been um, a psychiatrist for 30 years, conducting groundbreaking research and brain imaging on psychopaths. And, um, you know, tell us about the research and what inspired you to become a, a psychiatrist? Well, you know, I think all along I was very curious about Well, my father was very sick when I was young and doctors played a very big role in getting him well. So as a little girl, I always wanted to be a doctor, but you know, it was the 1950s. You're supposed to get an MRS, not an MD, you know, so I sort of didn't have the nerve or the guts to go through with it, you know? So I waited until I was in my twenties and I finished college and I went back to school and I, I, and took all the science and math courses that I was afraid to to take when I actually went to college, but I got into my, my number one choice, which was Columbia University. And I knew I was gonna be a psychiatrist because of my interest in emotions and how emotions affect people's lives. And I also was interested in the bad guys in general. Why do people do bad things? So it wound up that I, I ran a, uh, uh, for a short period of time, a, a criminal court clinic in the Bronx. And I was wondering, how does one figure out if a person's really a bad guy? They're, they're not crazy by you know, social standards or considered insane by legal standards. They're, they talk like ordinary people. So how do I figure this out? What happened is I came across a guy in Canada in Vancouver, Dr. Robert Hare, who was the world's expert at the time. And he was doing a lot of research on particularly language that he had uh, discovered that psychopaths talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. Mm -hmm. they, they talk a good game. And what is this? What is this about language? So they know the definition of emotions, but they don't know what the feeling of emotions were. So we challenged them using brain imaging, which meant 
in a you know a ra radioactive nucleotide going to the brain while they did a, a a language test is this or is this not a word the psychopaths and the normal subjects everybody knew what what the word was but the, the psychopaths used more brain regions when it came to a negatively charged emotional word mm -hmm. like Hitler or maggot, you know, bad words. So in other words, the normals, they didn't need much brain regions to do it. It was as if the normals were hardwired to understand emotional language, but the psychopaths needed more regions. So we hypothesized out of this research that emotional language for the psychopaths is like a learned language, like I'm learning French. I'm going to learn emotions. I can learn emotions mm. by learning French. It, like a foreign language in a way, like exactly. uh, listening to um, like listen to those uh, tapes or whatever it is. Exactly, um, exactly. Which I think really kind of makes intuitive sense because they know they know the words. They can talk the talk, as I said, but they don't really get get it on a, on a deep level. And that that's always been my interest. And as a psychiatrist, I'm a listener. You know, like you're a listener, you listen to people and you hear what they have to say and you get a sense of whether there's depth with it, you know, and, and, and you can start exploring how they feel and to the depths with which they understand their own feelings or understand other people. Now, I don't do psychotherapy with psychopaths psychopaths belong behind bars that's the best therapy for them <laughs> <laughs> i think you're worth the majority on that one too yeah <laughs> exactly, exactly exactly but you know there's a you know it's not like uh, these things are categorical P people can become psychopathic like under specialized conditions what is it like when your leaders are nazis what is it like when you're going to be reported by the person in your building for talking to someone you shouldn't talk to? When you're living under enormous fear the way the Germans did under the Nazis. And remember, they just recovered from a horrible World War I. They were poverty stricken. The men had been brutalized by the war. They were very vulnerable people. This is something that over the years, I've become more empathic to the vulnerability of, of human beings under such distress. So people under specialized con conditions would can do things they wouldn't necessarily do when, um, you know, in, in normal times. But I wondered if there was anything specific about these can, about these people who were influenced. And I found that there were people who are passive, who really ha look to somebody else to tell them what to do. And there are people like that. You know people like that. I know people like that. Mm -hmm. They can be passive or they can be very narcissistic. You know, like I'm superior. You know, it doesn't matter what the rules are. Those are, e these are slippery sliding ways into behaviors that they wouldn't necessarily do in a normal under normal circumstances so that that's that's kind of my contribution so uh, I go into this in my book to some degree as I listen to my lawyers talking to me and I hear the word rumor when I hear a rumor that the Nazi flag I don't like the word rumor I think it's kind of a, a cheap way of not telling the truth you get or, away or like or like gossip tabloid or whatever you hear on social media too yes. like you know tattle yeah. and all that yes I'm totally with you on that completely with you so I heard the the word rumor and I started to dig in more deeply in my thinking which is maybe when he said to me there's no way you could find out about whether the people were Nazis which is what I was told, you know, whoever took the building, I thought might be Nazis. He says, oh, there's no way you can find out. Well, that's not true. The lawyer found this, in, I mean, the, the, uh, the uh, investigator found this information within weeks of my hiring him. Wow. So there's, there was information that had I been a totally Germanly fluent person, um, you know, had I been able to live there during this case, I might have been able to find out myself, but I had a full time life in New York doing important things. So my detective got this information for me. Mm -hmm. I, I also a couple of things also came up as well, too, that uh, you talk about these various tests and everything psychopaths that um, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, ink block test or was a Rorschach or something. It's like you have these ink blots, like say, Rorschach, that's it. I was 
I was trying to think of the name. It's like these ink blots and come up like, like it can be this, it can be this, and like you right. know, splatter it all over. It's like you know, it, is it is it where the psychopaths um just just simply misinterpret it, or they just like just have advanced thinking? It's like you know, the, the, those are generally wish, tied into those. I wish I knew the answer to that. I don't know what they've done with with ink blots with psychopaths. I I do know that uh, that issues regarding language and how they, uh, you know, the tone, the, the tone with which they speak may be a little bit different, hand movements may be different, that there are things that may be physiologically different between the, the true psychopath and everyday people. I'm, I'm no longer a specialist or expert in this. The field has gotten enormous. I can say, however, that my paper that was published in a top journal was it has been quoted at least o- over 300 times over the years. Wow. Yeah. So it was the it was groundbreaking. Mm-hmm. And, and, and also too, psychopath as well too has been uh, branched off into a sociopath as well too. And, um, and of course, you've been in the field. Maybe you can give your interpretation of a sociopath as well too. Also, being like an offshoot, and absolutely. then thanks to social media, there could be another offshoot of a so sociopath or uh, anything else. Well, I'll tell you what the word the word originally was sociopath, and that word came about like in the 1930s. There was a, 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 a Dr. Birnbaum, I think it was his name. He came up with that word to because he believed that 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 social condi- social conditions like sociopath can make people bad guys. In other words, that bad guys were as a result of being poor and having no money. So that word sociopath came about. Psychopath emerged. It had been around in the 19th century, but psychopath reemerged through the work of Dr. Robert Hare. Um, because these guys, these men and women could be you know, wealthy. They could be poor. It had nothing to do with social conditions. But you okay. make a very interesting point about social media and its impact on people. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. And do you think, um, you know, you know, psychopaths and uh, sociopaths can also um, manipulate social media? And do you think social media encourages it? Or are they trying to uh, put a damper on it? I, I, I think that that's, again, a very good question. I think... Uh, Unfortunately, uh, young people are under the sw- you know the sway of this uh, uh, of, of social media, and in particular in combination with COVID, when kids were trapped at home, and you know, and I think they're they're vulnerable to it, and they're vul- vulnerable to bad guys entering the the social media world. Um, I don't think it makes psychopaths. I think it can. Um, uh, and I don't know if psychopaths are running social media. I have no idea. I, I, I can't opine on that at all. <laughs> but I do know it's it's uh, these are kind of treacherous times, and mm-hmm. uh, and social media has gotten a li- has gone a little bit too far. And I see the impact on some of my patients and on my patients' children that it's been very very difficult for them in combination with COVID when they've been isolated at home and that's what they're doing because their parents are trying to earn a living. So the kids are in front of uh, so- social media. It's been a v- very bad combination. Mm-hmm. And, and, and certainly as well too. And of course, uh, and, and of course, you know, final thoughts on the book as well too, with, um, with someone to Berlin. And of course, you know, after the ber- verdict with the uh, building and everything else and, um, you know, the building and everything else with Berlin, you know, just um, update on it and any final thoughts on the book? Sure. Um, Well, some incredible things happened after the case was over. Major museum exhibit occurred in Berlin, which I took part in about this particular area. That was wonderful. And a plaque was placed on the building to show that this was where the 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 Jewish star band was 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 manufactured so a lot of attention was given to that and uh, over the years I've been working on I wanted to tell the story throughout the time that I went to Berlin I took copious notes every meeting I went to I took notes and I started writing the book really like maybe in 2005 2006 I think there are six drafts of it already wow yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. It's hard to be a psychiatrist and, and to be an author and all and be a mother. But I did it all. And uh, in any case, uh, 
the book's going to come out not not this year, but you know the summer of next year. And I've been doing you know some uh, podcasts and talking and writing and uh, getting sort of trying to get a baseline of of you know people interested in the book and. That's that's where I'm at with it right now. I'm very excited about it. And certainly amazing too. Where can we find your book at? Right now, we it's it's uh, it's at the publisher, um, and we're we're designing the cover. And I will be sure to make sure that you know where the book is at. You will get a copy of the book and all the information. And I would love the privilege of coming back and actually showing you the book and giving you the book next year. Absolutely. And we'll make a spot for you. And I'm going to mark it on the calendar as well, too. I got yes. my secretary to do that. So <laughs> that's great. And what's coming up for uh, Dr. Joanne Intratour with uh, her uh, works as well? We'll find out just one minute. You listen okay. to the Mike Wagner Show at the Mike Wagner Show.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at SonicWebStudios.com for all your needs. Also brought to you by our official sponsor, the Mike Wagner Show, international warring author Mia Molson's The Missing, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. We'll be back with the author of Summon to Berlin, Dr. Joanne Intratour, after this time. The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Call 1 800 303 3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention the Mike Wagner show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Hey everybody, my name is Forbes Riley and I'm an American actress and a TV host and I was delighted when I got my copy of Missing, which is extraordinary relation of ordinary people based on a real life relationship. It's just it's well written. It's amazing. You know, it talks about a man who has lost his wife and his daughter, and it's very well done. I'm going to highly recommend that you go get your copy of Missing. It is a powerful, exciting read. Mr. Mian Moshe Zia, he is the author of Missing. And I want to give a big shout out and a kiss all the way halfway around the world to my dear friend. Check him out at Mia's website. It's called www.miamoshenzea.com. Missing, available on Amazon. Again, I'm Forbes Riley, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hey, hey, this is Ray Powers, and boy, are you in luck. Right place, right time. Tuned in to The Mike Wagner Show. You heard me. We're back with author Dr. Joanne Intratour with um, Summon to Berlin, a memoir here on The Mike Wagner Show, and um, just a great story you covered as well, too. Learned a lot about... um, you know, what's happened and everything else. And um, what else can you expect me in 2022 and beyond, Dr. Joanne? Well, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm really interested in taking care of my patients and working with them. And uh, I find that extremely exciting. And I've, been, I've built a great practice over the years. And I've been helping a lot of people through COVID and helping people through all sorts of issues. I want to continue writing. I've, I've got a uh, a very interesting article coming out actually in Berlin, actually any day. I don't know if you ever saw the movie, The Third Man with Orson Welles, one of the great movies. You know, I've, I've done a, a great story about, about that uh, movie because he's the, the quintessential psychopath. So I've, I'm, I'm writing that and I have a few other things on the drawing board. So I, I imagine that for the rest of my life, I'll be publishing. You mentioned Orson Welles too. The first thing comes is Rosebud. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, 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 exactly. That was a great movie. But my favorite is The Third Man. Mm, certainly one of the best. I'll have to check it out. And I'm yes. glad you remind me. So I have to go to Amazon Prime, Netflix, or anything like that. Exactly. And you'll get it. And, and I'll and send you the article. <laughs> yes, definitely will do so. And who do you consider biggest influence in your career? Biggest influence in my career. Whew. Well, I think uh, I think all the different uh, supervisors that I've had that I've brought my cases to, and there have been many. Also, Dr. Robert Hare in Vancouver, who is an extraordinary man. Um, and I think uh, my father has always played a bit bit of a voice for me. And I go to him when I feel I need you know encouragement. I go to him and talk to him. I know that may sound weird, but uh, who knows? In any case, um, 
uh, there have been uh, wonderful mentors over the years that I'm grateful for. And certainly amazing too. And what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? To try to be as grounded as they possibly can in their own life. You know, to stand, to stand up and feel their legs, you know, and their feet touching the ground and to try to be as realistic about their situation and to also try to maintain some hope uh, because it is a rough time. Mm -hmm. And certainly is as well, too. And we'll get through it. Once again, we're with uh, author Dr. Joanne Intratour with uh, Summon to Berlin, a memoir coming out soon on the Mike Weidner Show. Dr. Joanne, a very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Learned a lot from you. Looking forward to having you again soon. Make sure you keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Love to have you back. And um, once again, tell us about your upcoming projects. What's your website? How do people contact? Where can people uh, purchase or uh, acquire or check out the soon to be book? Right. You can find a lot of information on, on me with my name, joanneintratour.com. There's lots of information and there'll be updates all the time. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter and probably on many more things by in, in the next couple of months. We will certainly do so. Once again, Dr. Joanne, a very big thank you for your time. You've been totally amazing. Again, learned a lot from you. Looking forward to having you again soon. Make sure you keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Love to have you back. And we definitely wish you all the best and a great future ahead of you. Thank you for having me. I'm so, so glad. The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Call 1-800-303-3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention The Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to the next level. Hey everybody, my name is Forbes Riley and I'm an American actress and a TV host. And I was delighted when I got my copy of Missing, which is Extraordinary Relation of Ordinary People based on a real life relationship. It's just, it's well written, it's amazing. You know, it talks about a man who has lost his wife and his daughter and it's very well done. I'm gonna highly recommend that you go get your copy of Missing. It is a powerful, exciting read. Mr. Me and Moshe Zia. He is the author of Missing. And I want to give a big shout out and a kiss all the way halfway around the world to my dear friend. Check him out at Mia's website. It's called www.miamotionzea.com. Missing, available on Amazon. Again, I'm Forbes Riley, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Mike Wagner Show. Brought to you by international award-winning author Mia Mosinzia of Missing and powered by Sonic Web Studios. Be sure to join us again on over 40 podcast platforms and, of course, on the MikeWagnerShow.com, HamiltonRadio.net, and Diamonds FM. Don't forget to support our program with a generous donation at the MikeWagnerShow.com. Thanks for listening.